All right, kiddos. So this is going to be your lesson 26-12 uh, lesson video. And in this video, we are going to discuss how to graph and calculate inverses of square root functions, uh, how to derive a square root function or model from a table of data, uh, what the difference is between even and odd functions, and what a one-to-one -one function is. Okay, so a lot of that is just learning definitions, and a lot of this will be kind of repetitious to what we've already been doing. So let's start with EQ1. How do we graph and calculate the inverses of square root functions? So here we're given three functions, f, g, and h, and we're asked to find the inverses. So what we're going to do is find the inverses algebraically, and then we're going to prove them geometrically, in other words, on a graph, and you can see the Desmos links below. So first, let's prove f of x, or not prove, but let's go ahead and find its inverse. So I'll do this guy here in yellow. So if f of x equals uh, the square root of x, okay, I can go ahead and do the flip -roo and just say that x equals the square root of f, right? And I'm going to have to square both sides. So that's going to give me uh, x squared is equal to f inverse of x. Okay, so let's look at the graph and see that that is, in fact, the case. As soon as it loads up, there it goes. Okay, so here in blue, we see x squared, your regular quadratic parabola, and obviously that is the inverse to the square root function here in red, right? And you'll notice this green line here. This is y equals x and you see a clear symmetry here between the blue and the red and you may be noticing well if it is the inverse why is half of the sideways parabola missing well if i just do this right here if i just say negative square root of x well there's the other half but why do i have to have two separate functions now it's that's an algebraic question here so let's say that this was the other way around let's say f of x was x squared instead right and we were trying to find the inverse of this guy. Okay, so we would have to flip. So we would have uh, x equals f squared. We would have to take the square root of both sides. And this is what's important. Okay, remember when we would solve quadratics, when we would take the square root of both sides, right, there would always be two solutions. It would be plus or minus. So we should have plus or minus the square root of x equals uh, f inverse okay so that's why we're only seeing half of a parabola because when we go in the other direction we don't have to have uh, two solutions okay so let's look at g and h and i'm going to go through these a little quicker okay so g of h i'll do this guy in blue so if g of x is equal to two times the square root of x when i do the flip right i'm going to have two times the square root of g is equal to x. So I'm going to divide by 2 on both sides. I have x over 2. And then I'm going to square both sides. And I should probably put the square root symbol. And what I'm going to end up with is g inverse of x is equal to x squared over 4. Okay, and if we look at the graph here on Desmos, we can prove it geometrically because there's that same clear symmetry here about y equals x. So blue is our inverse. This is x squared over 4. And the initial function, g of x here in red, 2 times the square root of x, we see that we have a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Okay, And we see that our quadratic has a horizontal stretch by a factor of 4 or a vertical shrink factor of one-fourth. Okay, so pretty straightforward there. Okay, so last one, let's look at h of x, and I'll do this guy in green. Okay, so if h of x equals one-third, the square root of x plus one, all minus two, if I'm trying to find the inverse of h, well, I'm just gonna flip, so x equals one-third, the square root of h plus 1, all minus 2. Okay, I'm going to add 2 to both sides. Okay, 
multiply by three on both sides. And of course, then I'm going to square both sides. And that's going to give me nine times X plus two all squared. Then I'm going to have to do minus one here at the end. So minus one is equal to H inverse of X. Okay. And again, we can prove that geometrically. And here again, we clearly see symmetry between the blue and red about the green line, the green line being y equals x, the blue line being our quadratic inverse of the square root function in red. Okay. So, I mean, none of this is really new. We're just building and building and building upon the same concepts. So now we're going to go into something that is a little bit new, uh, but not entirely. So let's say we're given a table. Okay, and this table of data represents the length of a pendulum. If you don't know what a pendulum is, think of like a grandfather clock and it has a pendulum that swings back and forth to keep time like a metronome. Okay, so this is the length of the, perium, the pendulum versus its period. Okay, and if you don't know what a period is, it's just a time period. So I tell you right here in parentheses uh, that a period is how long it takes for a pendulum to begin its swing, go all the way to where it's fully extended and then come all the way back to where it started. Okay, and you can clearly see here in the data that as the length of the pendulum increases, so too does the period of the swing, right? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do, I'm gonna go ahead and plot these points and you're gonna see how annoying and cumbersome this is. So 0 0.6 by 0 0.8 and 10 by 1.0 and 14 by 1.2 going a little bit cross out here trying to follow the points 1.35 uh, or 18 by 1.35 so 18 1.35 that would be about right here we'll say and 22 by 1.5 exactly so it kind of jumps up there okay and 26 by 1.6, that would be right, let's see, I'm having a brain fart. Yeah, it'd be right here. And 1.3523, yeah, I goofed, that would be right there. So I need to erase that guy. Anyway, you can see how annoying this is. Okay, so if I keep going, I mean, it, it kind of resembles something. It almost looks like it's linear, right? But it's very difficult to do this by hand. Okay, so if I follow these steps that I've got here, okay, and I, I'm already told to assume that a square, function, a square root function will fit this data. But again, we can see how annoying this is. So if this was a square root function, it would look something like this, right? And we'd be starting at zero. And we're also assuming that there's no uh, horizontal or vertical shift or anything like that. Okay. So to make better use of what it is we're trying to do, but before, before I do that, let's look at what the parent function is. So f of x is the square root of x, right? Well, we see that there's some kind of a transformation as far as stretch or shrink, right? So if we're all the way at four and we're still not even to one yet in the time axis, right? Our length depends on, or sorry, our time of the period depends on the length of the pendulum. So if our X axis is here at six and we're not even to one yet, right? And then we're at 30, you know, 36 and we're still not even to two yet. Okay, we're obviously being stretched horizontally or shrunk vertically. So that means that the absolute value of A is less than one and greater than zero. In other words, we have a fraction here. Okay. So if I was to say that our square root function was f of x equals sum A times the square root of x, we would know this to be true about our stretch factor. Okay. So to get a better idea, we're going to go ahead and just use Desmos to our advantage. Okay, and I should probably write these points down first. 
or actually I know what I can do. I can move this guy over to the side and look at it separately. Let me see, there we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna wanna do, click on this plus sign and I'm gonna enter table. Okay, and I'm gonna plug in my X and Y values. So the first point is uh, six by 0.8 and you'll see I just tabbed over and it already made a point for me. Next point is 10 by one. Next point is 14 by 1.2 and you can see this is a lot easier than having to do this by hand. 18 uh, by 1.35. I'm just going to keep going here, do a few more. 22 by 1.5 and 26 by 1.6 and 30 by 1.75 okay and i also had to mess with the settings a little bit just so it would all fit on the screen and if you have trouble with that just let me know i can help you out with that but i want to keep this video kind of short so i'm not going to go into too too much detail so here's all my points that I have from the table. Okay, and let me go ahead and stretch this out a little bit more. Okay, so what I want to do next is click down here, and I want to enter in a square root function. Okay, except I'm going to say A. We still don't know what A is. And then I'm going to hit SQRT. That's shorthand to tell the computer that it wants, that we want a square root symbol, a radical. Okay, and x so now i have my function of x and then right here because i have this unknown a instead of a number i'm going to go ahead and hit add slider okay and you see it gives us a square root function except it's way vertically stretched compared to because we have our x-axis really long compared to our y-axis okay so what i'm going to do to fix that a little bit oops not what i meant to do put that back to one if it'll let me Oh, no, negative one. I'll put that back to one. I'm going to click here on this 10. And I'm going to go ahead and say, so I want it between zero and one, right? Because we know A is somewhere between zero and one. And for the step, right, this is how sensitive it's going to be when you slide the A. So I'm going to put point zero one. Okay, and see how that works out. So... I'm going to keep sliding this guy until it fits my data. And I was really close. That's about as close as I'm going to get. So that pretty much tells me that my A value must be about 0.32. So I must have a vertical stretch factor of about 0.32, or we could even go so far as to say uh, one third. So if I click down here and make another one and I do one third uh, and then times the square root of x, right? You'll see I'm pretty close, so it's not quite one third. I think 0.32 is about as close as it's gonna get, okay? But anyway, useful little trick there with Desmos, and I can't stress enough how awesome Desmos is. Okay, so let me bring my screen back over here for you. Okay, so it was a lot easier to use the technology than it was to just do that by hand. So let's go ahead and jump right into EQ2, okay? And well, before I get too excited, so what was the point of all of that? So the point of all of that was that we could say that the graph that fits this data here in this table, the graph that fits this data would probably be very, very similar to f of x equals 0.32 times the square root of x. And that's gonna give us all these values pretty dang close, okay? And that's actually the real nature of reality is just getting as close to perfect as you can because obviously perfect isn't ever really possible. All right, so EQ3, uh, let's really quickly go ahead and find the difference between even and odd functions. And to be quite honest with you, it, it's really not that difficult to figure out which one it is, if a function is even or odd or, or neither, right? So I have these definitions here for even and odd. And if you want to go ahead and pause the screen and write that down real fast, and then here's a couple very, very basic examples, uh, feel free to do so. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to these more complicated examples real quick. And we're just going to prove if they are even, odd, or neither. Okay. 
And before I take off, so an obvious thing to notice to the graph of something that is odd, or sorry, even, is you see an obvious symmetry vertically, right? So if I took, if I took a ruler or something, I'd be able to split this guy vertically. That is evidence, geometric evidence, that the function is even. However, however, if there is not function, if there is not symmetry vertically, uh, like so, okay, it's safe to assume that the function is odd. But there are functions that are neither even or odd, and that's where you're going to have to do the algebra anyway. Okay, so here in these examples, one, two, and three, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so give algebraic proof that the given function is either even, odd, or neither. So let's look at f first. So I'm going to check. Well, first, to do this, you need to calculate what is f of negative x and what is negative f of x. If you have both of these two, you'll easily be able to tell if your function is even, odd, or neither. Okay? So first, let's go ahead and check for that. And I'll use a different color than white. So 2x squared minus 3. So let's calculate f of negative x first. And if you remember from composition of functions, instead of an x everywhere, right, I'm going to have a negative x everywhere that there is an x. So instead of 2x squared, I'm going to have 2 times negative x squared. Okay, and then minus 3. Right, and you're going to see that negative x squared, well, that's just positive x squared again, because negative times negative gives you a positive. So I'm still going to have just 2x squared minus 3, which means negative uh, f of negative x is equal to f of x, which means that the function is even. Okay, so this guy is even. And I have definitive proof right here. f of x is equal to f of negative x. So let me switch colors here. So let's check out g of x. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to check out what is g of negative x. Okay, so that's going to give me 3 times negative x cubed minus 1. And negative x cubed, well, that's going to be negative x cubed whenever I multiply that out. Oops. Okay. So positive x squared and negative x cubed. Okay, so I'm going to have negative 3x cubed minus 1. So this does not equal uh, g of x, but let's see something else. So let's calculate, well, what is negative g of x? Right, so that basically just means I'm going to put a negative sign here. Okay, so... What are we going to have here? And give me ones. Okay, so all we're going to do is take this negative. All we're going to do is take this negative here and just distribute it into the function g of x. Okay, so I'm going to write down, well, what is g of x? So it's 3x cubed and minus 1. And when I distribute, I'm going to end up with negative 3x cubed. Oh, we're close but we're going to have plus 1 instead of minus 1. Okay, so negative g of x does not equal uh, g of negative x. Okay, this was g of negative x here. Okay, and for it to be odd, that has to be the case. Okay, so it is not odd, and it's not even, so it is neither. Okay, let's check out h of x. Erase and make some room here. Okay, so h of x. Uh, use blue. Okay, h of x. First, we're going to do h of negative x. So 4 times the square root of negative x minus 2. And all of that plus 1. Okay, so when I simplify, quote unquote, there's not really a whole lot to do, negative x minus 2, and then plus 1, okay, 
we get a little bit of a change, but h of negative x still is not equivalent to uh, the original h of x, so it's not even. Okay, and let's check out negative h of x. Okay, so negative h of x is going to give me negative and then times 4 square root of x minus 2, uh, all of that plus 1. Okay, I'm going to distribute the minus, so it's going to become negative 4 square root of x minus 2 minus 1 when I distribute. Okay, so we see that negative h of x is not equal to uh, h of negative x, so it's not odd, so it also is neither. Okay, so that's how we check for even or odd functions. Okay, and really quick, let's go ahead and finish this off. Uh, let's answer the EQ for what is a one-to-one -one function. And again, here's a definition. If you need to pause the screen and write that down, by all means do so. But all it really is, is every Y value has to correspond to only one x value okay for it to be one to one every y value so every element of its range every y value that's a fancy way of saying you know y values every y value has to correspond to exactly one element of its domain in other words every y value has to correspond to exactly one value of x okay so looking at this f of x here okay square root of x so when we start off here at negative 3, well, we're going to get imaginary, imaginary, or undefined. It's not going to be graphable, quote unquote. And when we start at 0, we see that for every y, for every y, we get an individually separate x, right? Okay, now let's check out this other guy over here, g of x. So g of x is x squared, okay? So, right off the bat, we can go ahead and start matching things. So, at y equals 100, we have two values of x. So, for 100, we have a match at negative 10 and at positive 10. Okay, and we see it again with negative 8 and positive 8 and so on and so on and so on. It's a parabola, right? So, this guy would not be 1 to 1, okay, because I have a y value that corresponds to more than one x value, okay, that's the, that's the simplest way I can put the difference between a function that is 1 to 1 and one that is not 1 to 1, okay, all right, so that's it for this video, kiddos, and I'm getting closer to keeping it under 20 minutes, I'm really trying to stay true to that, but I'm at 23. I was close. Well, anyway, uh, make sure and take detailed notes, ask a lot of questions, and get after it on your practice. Come through tutoring if you need to do so. Goodbye.